This place was once full of activity, a place of social enjoyment, business, commerce. It was a place of education, pleasure, prosperity and luxury. Now it lies in ruins. This is Babylon city. They never would have thought that this well fortified city could ever be overthrown. But it was. The Babylonians expected prosperity, but their expectation was wrong. It's always very perplexing when bad things happen to us by surprise and we don't understand why. But when something is expected and understood, it gives the mind stability. The author of the book of Daniel came from a ruined city and he had an expectation and this gave him stability of mind. God used this man Daniel to give an expectation to the king of Babylon, showing him what would happen to his kingdom and his beloved city. God wants you and me to have an expected end and he's using the book of Daniel to show us what to expect in these last days. Jeremiah 29 verse 11 tells us, For I know the thoughts that I think toward you, saith the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you an expected end. God loves you and wants you to have an expected end. Unlike the Babylonians, we need to take heed to the warnings. I invite you to come with us as we go through the prophecies of Daniel, step by step, to see what God wants us to know. The first thing that we need to understand when studying prophecy is found in 2 Peter chapter 1 and verse 20. Knowing this first, that no prophecy of the scripture is of any private interpretation. This means that biblical prophecies are not concocted ideas. They are real events that really took place. Therefore, we need the pages of history. We need public knowledge to unlock the prophecies. Before we open the book of Daniel, we need historical context. In the year 760 BC, Assyria was driving for world domination. The capital city, Nineveh. The Assyrians were among the most feared and hated people of ancient times. And because of their wicked deeds, this nation's time was quickly drawing to an end. And as always, God wanted to give a warning before destruction. So God sent Jonah to Nineveh. And you can probably imagine why Jonah did not want to go, considering it was the metropolis of the world, it was crushing nations around it, and Jonah's own country was on their hit list. But after his uncomfortable Mediterranean detour, Jonah did go to Nineveh. And the warning was heeded to, from king to peasant, all repented. And God turned away from the judgment that was to come upon Assyria. This warning was lost sight of. And by 745 BC, Tiglath-Pileser III ascended the throne and he took Assyria to new heights. The pages of history tell us, Tiglath-Pileser III, king of Assyria, 745 to 727 BC, inaugurated the last and greatest phase of Assyrian expansion. He subjected Syria and Palestine to his rule and later he merged the kingdoms of Assyria and Babylonia. It was during the reign of Tiglath-Pileser III that Isaiah began his ministry. And God used Isaiah to give a warning to his people of the impending Assyrian invasion. O oh, Assyrian, the rod of mine anger and the staff in their hand is mine indignation. I will send him against an hypocritical nation and against the people of my wrath will I give him a charge to take the spoil and to take the prey and to tread them down like the mire of the streets. During Isaiah's ministry, the kingdom of Israel was already divided into two parts. The northern kingdom, Israel, was comprised of ten tribes, and its capital was Samaria. The southern kingdom, Judah, was comprised of two tribes, and its capital was Jerusalem. The ministry of Isaiah was conducted in the southern kingdom of Judah. The northern kingdom, Israel, had rejected warning after warning, given by Elijah, Elisha, and Amos. 
and around 750 BC, Hosea sounded the final call. Hosea testified of the spiritual adultery taking place in Israel. Israel was trying to serve two masters, a bit of God and a bit of Baal. It's like a bit of Christ and a bit of the world, a bit of hot and a bit of cold. Israel became lukewarm and Hosea's message was unheeded. And now Israel was without a prophet. And as the Bible says, where there is no vision, the people perish. For the children of Israel walked in all the sins of Jeroboam, which he did. They departed not from them, until the Lord removed Israel out of his sight, as he had said by all his servants, the prophets. So was Israel carried away out of their own land to Assyria unto this day. These words of scripture were fulfilled over a ten-year period. In 732 BC, Tiglath-Pileser took control of the northern portion of Israel. By 722 BC, King Shalmaneser came to complete the job. But Shalmaneser died while besieging the rebellious city of Samaria. And in the same year, his brother Sargon took control and completed the conquest and scattered Israel, while Judah remained. Therefore, thus saith the Lord concerning the king of Assyria, He shall not come into this city, nor shoot an arrow there, nor come before it with shields, nor cast a bank against it. By the way that he came, by the same shall he return, and shall not come into this city, saith the Lord. For I will defend this city to save it for mine own sake, and for my servant David's sake. Wherever there is great success, there is pride and arrogance. In 705 BC, Sennacherib ascended the throne of Assyria, and in his conquests he came to the city of Jerusalem. He stood outside the city wall and mocked the people, saying, The Egyptians' God couldn't help them, the Medes' God couldn't help them, and all the nation's gods couldn't help them. Then Sennacherib boastfully said, Neither can your God help you. But God had a big lesson to teach Sennacherib. And this lesson is recorded in Isaiah chapter 37. Then the angel of the Lord went forth and smote in the camp of the Assyrians a hundred and fourscore and five thousand. And when they arose early in the morning, behold, they were all dead corpses. So Sennacherib king of Assyria departed and went and returned and dwelt at Nineveh. A hundred and eighty-five thousand troops dead. Understandably, Sennacherib went straight home to Nineveh and stayed there. From then on, history tells us that Sennacherib engaged more in architectural work than in global conquests. But God had another warning to give to Assyria. And this is recorded in Isaiah chapter 10 and verse 12. Wherefore it shall come to pass that when the Lord hath performed his whole work upon Mount Zion and on Jerusalem, I will punish the fruit of the stout heart of the king of Assyria and the glory of his high looks. God always gives time for people to repent. And so time went on in the Assyrian Empire. By 699 BC, Ashurbanipal, the last great king, ascended the throne of Assyria. By 640 BC, God chose Nahum to be his prophet. Before the Assyrian Empire started declining, God sent Nahum to give a very clear warning to Nineveh of its destruction, as Jonah did over a hundred years before, because God wanted Assyria to have an expected end. Behold, I am against thee, saith the Lord of hosts, and I will discover thy skirts upon thy face, and I will show the nations thy nakedness and the kingdoms thy shame. And I will cast abominable filth upon thee, and make thee vile, and will set thee as a gazing stock. And it shall come to pass that all they that look upon thee shall flee from thee, and say, Nineveh is laid waste. Who will bemoan her? Whence shall I seek comforters for thee? Ashurbanipal rejected the warnings given by Nahum the prophet. And by 627 BC he died. Assyria then fell into civil war. And by 620 BC... A man from the tribe of the Chaldees named Nebuchadnezzar gained control of Babylon. In 612 BC, he sent his armies from Babylon to Nineveh. 
The general of the army was Nebuchadnezzar. Nebuchadnezzar completely annihilated Nineveh. And by 605 BC, he ascended the throne as sole ruler when his father, Nebuchadnezzar, died. And now God raises Daniel to give a warning to Nebuchadnezzar. After Nineveh was destroyed in 612 BC, the Assyrian kingdom was divided into three main powers. Media controlled the north and northeast. Babylon controlled Elam and the plains of the Euphrates and the Tigris. Egypt controlled everything west of the Euphrates and North Africa. It was within this division that Egypt controlled that this city, Jerusalem, found herself paying homage to Egypt. The kingdom of Judah became a vassal unto the king of Egypt. This city trusted in Egypt for security instead of trusting to the Most High that ruleth in the kingdoms of men. The divine record shows us this in 2 Kings 23. And Pharaoh Necho made Eliakim the son of Josiah king in the room of Josiah his father and turned his name to Jehoiakim and took Jehoahaz away. And he came to Egypt and died there. And Jehoiakim gave the silver and the gold to Pharaoh, but he taxed the land to give the money according to the commandment of Pharaoh. He exacted the silver and the gold of the people of the land, of every one according to his taxation, to give it unto Pharaoh Necho. The growing power and ambition of Babylon soon led to a clash with Egypt. The Babylonian crown prince Nebuchadnezzar was taking control from his aging father. In 607 BC, Nebuchadnezzar embarks on a military campaign. This campaign took them, among other places, to Kashmish. It was there that the armies of Egypt and Babylon met during 605 BC, which was the fourth year of Jehoiakim's reign over Judah. In this battle at Kashmish, Pharaoh, Necho, and Nebuchadnezzar fulfilled the words of God in Jeremiah chapter 46. The word of the Lord which came to Jeremiah the prophet against the Gentiles. Against Egypt, against the army of Pharaoh Necho, king of Egypt, which was by the river Euphrates in Carchemish, which Nebuchadrezzar, king of Babylon, smote in the fourth year of Jehoiakim, the son of Josiah, king of Judah. The word that the Lord spake to Jeremiah the prophet, how Nebuchadrezzar, king of Babylon, should come and smite the land of Egypt. Declare ye in Egypt, stand fast and prepare thee, for the sword shall devour round about thee. The Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, saith, Behold, I will punish the multitude of No and Pharaoh and Egypt with their gods and their kings, even Pharaoh and all them that trust in him. And I will deliver them into the hand of those that seek their lives, and into the hand of Nebuchadrezzar, king of Babylon, and into the hand of his servants. Egypt and their allies were overcome and put to flight in a single battle. Nebuchadnezzar stripped Pharaoh of his conquests and drove him back into Egypt. The completeness of this victory is recorded in 2 Kings chapter 24. And the king of Egypt came not again any more out of his land, for the king of Babylon had taken from the river of Egypt unto the river Euphrates all that pertained to the king of Egypt. History tells us that after this victory, Nebuchadnezzar's father died on the 16th of August, 605 BC. Within three weeks, Nebuchadnezzar was back into Babylon and ascended the throne as sole ruler although he was already joint ruler in 607 BC, two years before. It was during this military campaign that Nebuchadnezzar came to this city, Jerusalem, and besieged it. It was the third year of Jehoiakim's reign over Jerusalem. This was the accomplishment of the first words of the book of Daniel. In the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, came Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, unto Jerusalem and besieged it. And the Lord gave Jehoiakim king of Judah into his hand with part of the vessels of the house of God, which he carried into the land of Shinar to the house of his God, and he brought the vessels into the treasure house of his God. It would have been a hard thing to have lived here and witnessed the terrors of battle, seeing your beloved city and the temple destroyed, the treasures taken, and worst of all, the young, talented children of the royal house taken captive. 
But God had given Jerusalem a very clear warning of what to expect. He warned them through his prophet Isaiah 107 years beforehand. And this is found in 2 Kings chapter 20. And Isaiah said unto Hezekiah, Hear the word of the Lord. Behold, the days come that all that is in thine house and that which thy fathers have laid up in store unto this day shall be carried into Babylon. Nothing shall be left, saith the Lord. And of thy sons that shall issue from thee, which thou shalt beget, shall they take away. And they shall be eunuchs in the palace of the king of Babylon. The Hebrews were taken captive into Babylon in 606 BC. This marks the beginning of the 70-year prophecy spoken by Jeremiah the prophet. As Daniel and his three friends went into Babylon, they went via Haran. And thus they retraced the steps that Abraham originally made when he was called out of the land of the Chaldees. These young men would have been greatly discouraged as they went into Babylon. But you can imagine how much comfort they received by the words recorded here in Jeremiah. For thus saith the Lord, that after seventy years be accomplished at Babylon, I will visit you and perform my good word toward you in causing you to return to this place. For I know the thoughts that I think toward you, saith the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you an expected end. Then shall ye call upon me, and ye shall go and pray unto me, and I will hearken unto you. And ye shall seek me and find me, when ye shall search for me with all your heart. And I will be found of you, saith the Lord, and I will turn away your captivity, and I will gather you from all the nations, and from all the places whither I have driven you, saith the Lord. And I will bring you again into the place whence I caused you to be carried away captive. Daniel and his three friends sought the Lord during this catastrophic event. And they found God to be a personal comfort and guide. Have you found God in your calamities? Babylon city, the hub of the ancient world. Never before or after has there been a city like this. The Bible calls it the glory of kingdoms, the beauty of the Chaldees' excellency. On entering this city, Daniel and his companions were immediately placed in the Babylonian education system. In 603 BC, their third year, they completed their education and in the same year entered the service of the king. Nebuchadnezzar was in his second year reign as sole ruler, which was his fourth year reign, according to Jewish chronology, commencing when he was joint ruler with his father. Events occurred that severely tested the integrity of these youthful Hebrews and proved to an idolatrous nation the power and faithfulness of God. And in the second year of the reign of Nebuchadnezzar, Nebuchadnezzar dreamed dreams, wherewith his spirit was troubled and his sleep break from him. This remarkable dream made a deep impression upon the mind of Nebuchadnezzar, but he found it impossible to recall the particulars. History tells us why this was such a problem for the king. In Mesopotamia, the king was viewed as the cultic mediator between God and man. As head of all the priests of the country, he had important cultic functions at the New Year's festival. The king may be the recipient of a direct revelation of the will of a god, in Mesopotamia, the duty of the king to ascertain the will of the gods was more strongly emphasized. A directive of the gods could result from omens, dreams, or reading the entrails of offerings. All major undertakings of the king were dependent on directives of the god, who was to be consulted in advance. So forgetting the dream was like forgetting a direct revelation from God about future events. And that's exactly what it was. Then the king commanded to call the magicians and the astrologers and the sorcerers and the Chaldeans for to show the king his dreams. So they came and stood before the king. The king called for all the spiritualistic groups in Babylon 
but not for Daniel and his friends. Why? Because they did not belong to such classes of people. The king offered great rewards for revealing the dream or a gruesome death for failing to fulfill his demands. The king did not get his request. For this cause the king was angry and very furious and commanded to destroy all the wise men of Babylon. And the decree went forth that the wise men should be slain. And they sought Daniel and his fellows to be slain. After this decree, Daniel secured extra time from the king. The sacred record tells us that he returned home, informed his companions, and they sought the Lord to unveil the dream to them. Then was the secret revealed unto Daniel in a night vision. Then Daniel blessed the God of heaven. Daniel answered and said, Blessed be the name of God forever and ever, for wisdom and might are his. One thing that Daniel realized in this dream that we also need to realize is that God is the ruling power in the affairs of this world. He sets up kings and removes kings to fulfill his own purpose. Daniel had utmost confidence in what God had shown him. He didn't go to the king asking, is this your dream? Instead, he gave God thanks for showing him the king's matter. Then Arioch brought in Daniel before the king in haste and said thus unto him, I have found a man of the captives of Judah that will make known unto the king the interpretation. Daniel declares plainly to King Nebuchadnezzar that the source of all wisdom, knowledge and understanding of future events doesn't come from him, but comes from the God of heaven. And that the purpose of God in giving him this dream was to reveal what shall be in the latter days. Daniel then related the dream. Thou, O king, sawest, and behold, a great image. This great image, whose brightness was excellent, stood before thee, and the form thereof was terrible. This image's head was of fine gold, his breast and his arms of silver, his belly and his thighs of brass, his legs of iron, his feet, part of iron, and part of clay. Thou sawest, till that a stone was cut out without hands, which smote the image upon his feet that were of iron and clay, and break them to pieces. Then was the iron, the clay, the brass, the silver, and the gold broken to pieces together, and became like the chaff of the summer threshing floors. And the wind carried them away, that no place was found for them. And the stone that smote the image became a great mountain, and filled the whole earth. As Daniel related the facts, the dream came fresh to the king's mind. Nebuchadnezzar was an idolater. Therefore, this image was an object which at once commanded his attention and respect. This image is a comprehensive outline of world history. The glorious kingdom of Babylon formed the head of gold. All following kingdoms decreased in splendor but increased in strength as shown by the grades of metal. First gold, then silver, brass, and iron. In the latter part of the world's history, a marked change was revealed in the iron mixed with clay and the stone that destroyed these kingdoms and filled the whole earth with its own. Let us walk through history as we enlarge this interpretation. This is the dream, and we will tell the interpretation thereof before the king. Thou, O king, art a king of kings. For the God of heaven hath given thee a kingdom, power, and strength, and glory. And wheresoever the children of men dwell, the beasts of the field and the fowls of the heaven, hath he given into thine hand, and hath made thee ruler over them all. Thou art this head of gold. Nebuchadnezzar reigned over Babylon for 43 years, from 605 B.C. to 562 B.C. It was during this time that his kingdom rose to the nation that was represented by the golden head. Babylon was the recognized center of cultic religion, wealth and education. Thus it was that all kingdoms and people were under the shadow of her influence and power. Gold flowed into Babylon from all provinces of its empire. The immense treasures gathered by King Solomon in Jerusalem were all taken by Nebuchadnezzar, giving to his kingdom a tremendous amount of gold. The Greek historian Herodotus visited this city about 454 BC and testified to the glory and splendor of this city. It was the golden kingdom of a golden age. Babylon, its metropolis, 
towered to a height never reached by any of its successors. Situated in the Garden of the East, laid out in a perfect square 60 miles in circumference, 15 miles on each side, surrounded by a wall 350 feet high and 87 feet thick, with a moat around it of equal cubic capacity. Laid out in luxuriant pleasure grounds and gardens, interspersed with magnificent dwellings, this city, with its 60 miles of moat, its 60 miles of outer wall, its 30 miles of river wall through its center, its hanging gardens, rising terrace above terrace, its 150 gates of solid brass, its temple of Belus, three miles in circumference, its perfect arrangement for convenience, ornament and defense, with unlimited resources, this city was itself a wonder of the world. Never before saw the earth a city like this, never since has it seen its equal, and there, with nations prostrate at her feet, Babylon was a true queen in peerless grandeur. The historian Gibbon records that the cities of the Babylonian Empire were plundered for almost a thousand years and still there was gold to be found. After the death of Nebuchadnezzar in 562 BC, he was followed by a succession of kings, which ended with Belshazzar and his father, who were overthrown by the Medes and Persians in 539 BC, fulfilling these words. And after thee shall arise another kingdom inferior to thee. As silver is of less value than gold, so the Medo-Persian Empire was inferior in splendor, luxury and magnificence to the kingdom of Babylon, but not in strength. To understand the Medo-Persian Empire, we need some background knowledge on its rulers. The scriptures name two individuals who are involved in the overthrow of Babylon. The first one is recorded in Daniel chapter 5. In that night was Belshazzar the king of the Chaldeans slain. And Darius the Median took the kingdom, being about threescore and two years old. The other individual is recorded in Isaiah chapter 45. Thus saith the Lord to his anointed, to Cyrus, whose right hand I have holden, to subdue nations before him. And I will loose the loins of kings, to open before him the two-leaved gates, and the gates shall not be shut. Darius was a Mede, and Cyrus was a Persian. The two arms of the image represented the alliance between Media and Persia. Cyrus was the son of Cambyses, king of Persia. His mother, Mandane, was the daughter of the Median king, Astagus. When Astagus died, his son, Cyaxares II, also known as Darius the Mede, took rulership over Media. However, Cyrus held sway over Media and Persia, but was not sole ruler. After Cyrus had taken Babylon, history informs us that he gave authority to his aged uncle, Darius the Mede. The historian Prideau says Darius the Mede, that is Cyaxares, the uncle of Cyrus, took the kingdom, for Cyrus allowed him the title of all his conquests as long as he lived. Although Darius was in his later years, he only ruled by permission of the real conqueror, Cyrus. And now when the march had brought them into Media, Cyrus turned aside to visit Cyaxares, after they had met and embraced, Cyrus began by telling Cyaxares that a palace in Babylon and an estate had been set aside for him. Cyrus the Great led the Medo-Persian army against the city of Babylon in 539 BC. He was guided by the Lord to fulfill divine prophecy that was written over a hundred years before he was born. Thus saith the Lord to his anointed, to Cyrus, whose right hand I have holden, to subdue nations before him. And I will loose the loins of kings to open before him the two-leaved gates, and the gates shall not be shut. I will go before thee and make the crooked places straight. I will break in pieces the gates of brass and cut in sunder the bars of iron. And I will give thee the treasures of darkness and hidden riches of secret places that thou mayest know that I, the Lord, which call thee by thy name and the God of Israel. Not only does God tell of Cyrus's name before he was born, but he also ordained the method of conquering the great city Babylon. Cyrus diverted the river Euphrates, enabling him to march under the wall and through the gate that was left open. However, by this time, the trenches were dug 
and Cyrus heard that it was a time of high festival in Babylon, when the citizens drink and make merry the whole night long. As soon as the darkness fell, he set his men to work. The mouths of the trenches were opened, and during the night the water poured in, so that the riverbed formed a highway into the heart of Babylon. When the great stream had taken to its new channel, Cyrus ordered his Persian officers to bring up their thousands, horse and foot alike, the allies to follow in their old order. They lined up immediately, and Cyrus made his own bodyguard descend into the dry channel first to see if the bottom was firm enough for marching. After Darius had put Daniel in the lion's den, he died in 536 BC, leaving Cyrus sole ruler over the empire. Cyrus was a believer in religious liberty, and in the same year, 536, he made his famous decree allowing the Jews to return home to Jerusalem. Undoing what Nebuchadnezzar had done in 606 BC when he first besieged Jerusalem and took the Jews captive into Babylon, thus completing the prophecy spoken by Jeremiah. For thus saith the Lord, that after seventy years be accomplished at Babylon, I will visit you and perform my good word toward you in causing you to return to this place. After the death of Cyrus, his son Cambyses II ruled for seven years, from 530 to 523 BC. In 522, his younger brother Smyrdas held the scepter for seven months. Then in 521 BC, Darius the Persian, also known as Darius the Great, ascended the throne. It was under his rulership that the empire answered most fully to the silver of the great image. He also expanded the empire to its height. Darius conducted the introduction of a universal currency, the Daric. Darius supplied the coinage system as a transnational currency to regulate trade and commerce throughout his empire. Early in his reign, Darius wanted to organize the loosely organized empire with a system of taxation. To do this, Darius created 20 provinces and specified fixed tributes that the satrapies were required to pay in Daric. There were two types of Daric, a gold and a silver. Only the king could mint gold Daric's. Important generals and satraps minted silver Daric's, thus making the silver Daric the most prevalent by far. The Daric was a major boost to international trade. Trade goods such as textiles, carpets, tools and metal objects began to travel throughout Asia, Europe and Africa. To further improve trade, Darius built a royal highway, a postal system and Phoenician-based commercial shipping. During Darius's Greek expedition, he had begun construction projects in Susa, Egypt and Persepolis. He had linked the Red Sea to the River Nile by building a canal, which ran from modern Zacchaeus to modern Suez in 497 BCE. Darius also built a canal to connect the Red Sea and the Mediterranean. Thus, silver poured into Persepolis, the capital of the empire. This silver-rich kingdom became a true pioneer in global economy. It was this King Darius that gave the second decree to rebuild Jerusalem. After his death, Xerxes, the husband of Queen Esther, became extremely wealthy as a result of this inherited economy. Xerxes was succeeded by Artaxerxes, who gave the third decree to restore and rebuild Jerusalem in 457 BC. After his death, Medo-Persia continued for another 93 years, ending with Darius III, who lost the kingdom to Alexander the Great in 331. BC. Welcome to this ancient citadel, known as the Acropolis. This place was brought to ruins by Xerxes, the husband of Queen Esther, in 480 BC, during the Battle of Salamina. During the time of the Medo-Persian Empire, the Greeks were not a united people. 
Greek territory was made up of many city-states, each having their own king or government. Fighting among these states was common. Athens and Sparta have become notorious for such battles. Within the northern state of Macedon, a man named Philip ascended the throne in 359 BC. King Philip II of Macedon united the greater part of Greece through diplomacy and warfare. In 337 BC, he created the League of Corinth. Many of the city-states became members of this league. In 336 BC, he died, leaving a united Greece to his successor and son, Alexander. With this united front, the young king Alexander was now in a position to lead the Greeks to the fulfilment of biblical prophecy. And another third kingdom of brass, which shall bear rule over all the earth. Brass was used by God to represent the Greek Empire, although the brass of the Bible is referring to a copper alloy known today as bronze. Thus we have the three classical metals, gold, silver and bronze. The Greeks were experts at smelting bronze. The soldiers wore breastplates of bronze, helmets of bronze, carried shields of bronze and used swords made from bronze. The success of the Greek and Macedonian army was largely found in their leader, Alexander. At age 13, Alexander was schooled by Aristotle. At age 16, he was a warrior in the army. At age 18, he was general. At age 20, he was proclaimed king. At age 26, he had conquered the Persian Empire and was named Lord of Asia. Throughout all his life, he never lost a battle. And then... On the 10th of June, 323 BC, Alexander died in Babylon. When Alexander the Great died, he left behind a huge empire. Alexander's empire stretched from his homeland of Macedon through the Greek city-states that his father had subdued to Bactria and parts of India in the east. It included Anatolia, the Levant, Egypt, Babylonia and Persia. Without a chosen heir, there was an immediate dispute among his generals as to who should be his successor. This was the beginning of the Hellenistic period of Greek history. Greek territory was ruled by several Greek dynasties for over 160 years until the iron power of Rome was felt. Hellenization denotes the spread of Greek language, culture and population into the former Persian Empire after the death of Alexander. Greece was now the world-dominating power, but she was altogether different from the preceding two. Instead of gaining control through the power of government or religion, the Greeks gained control of the world through the power of the intellect, through education, arts, exploration, literature, theatre, architecture, music, mathematics, philosophy, science and Olympic sports. But in 168 BC, the Roman army defeated the Macedonian and Greek allies in the Battle of Piedna. Greece then was incorporated into the Roman Empire. So far, God has used metals to represent three kingdoms with perfect accuracy. We will now see why God chose iron to represent the fourth. And the fourth kingdom shall be strong as iron, for as much as iron breaketh in pieces and subdueth all things. And as iron that breaketh all these shall it break in pieces and bruise. This is undoubtedly the empire of Rome. The secular historian Edward Gibbon makes this remarkable statement regarding her iron power. The arms of the Republic sometimes vanquished in battle, always victorious in war, advanced with rapid steps to the Euphrates, the Danube, the Rhine and the ocean, and the images of gold or silver or brass that might serve to represent the nations and their kings were successively broken by the iron monarchy of Rome. Rome was the largest and longest lasting of all preceding kingdoms. The iron in the image shows us that Rome will last until the end of Earth's history. However, there are two phases of iron. One is iron alone, 
the other is mixed with miry clay. This is fulfilled in the pagan Roman Empire and the papal Roman Empire. The political philosopher Thomas Hobbes makes this interesting observation in the 1600s regarding papal Rome. And if a man considers the original of this great ecclesiastical dominion, he will easily perceive that the papacy is none other than the ghost of the deceased Roman Empire, sitting crowned upon the grave thereof. For so did the papacy start up on a sudden out of the ruins of that heathen power. Throughout Roman history, Rome has had seven differing heads of government. The first were kings ruling the kingdom. Next, Rome became a republic and were headed by consuls, which are two elected individuals holding office at the same time. Each consul had veto power over his colleague. The third was called a decemvirate, which is a Latin term meaning ten men. These elected ten men held the Roman administration from 451 BC to 449. Another head was called a triumvirate, which is simply a coalition of three men in administration. Yet another ruler Rome had were dictators. Dictators were dispersed throughout the history of the Roman Republic. The most famous of these would be Julius Caesar, who was declared perpetual dictator in 45 BC. The sixth head of government, emperors. Emperors differ from kings because an emperor is a king of kings. For example, King Herod was subservient to the emperor of Rome. Also, an emperor rules an empire as opposed to a kingdom. After the Germanic tribes dominated Rome, Rome was finally ruled by popes. Still today, the seat of the papal Roman Empire is located in the city of Rome. Rome began as a kingdom in around 753 BC. The first king was Romulus, who founded the city and named it after himself. The last king was an Etruscan king named Lucius Tarquinus Superbus. He was proud, tyrannical and lost favour in the eyes of the people. It was said that Lucius was a source of the phrase, the tall poppy syndrome. According to Livy, Tarquin cut off the heads of the tallest poppies in his garden as an allegory to instruct his son Sextus to pacify a recently conquered enemy city by executing its leading citizens. This is one of the many stories which leads to the modern expression of tall poppy syndrome to describe the phenomenon of tearing down individuals who rise too far above the majority. After Sextus violated a Roman noblewoman, the Tarquin family were removed from power and driven out by Roman aristocrats in 509 BC. At this time, the Roman Republic was formed. It was under the Republic that Rome came to be as strong as iron. Rome's expansion of territory commenced with the domination of the Italian peninsula. Rome then turned her eyes across the Mediterranean and fought three wars against their North African rival Carthage. These were known as the Punic Wars. It was during the Second Punic War that King Philip V of Macedon made an alliance with Carthage's general, Hannibal. This annoyed Rome, so Rome then took on these two powerful kingdoms at the same time. Carthage in the west and Macedon in the east. Rome first went to war with the Greek kingdom of Macedon in 214 BC and again in 200 BC. Rome then gained a decisive victory against the Greeks at Pydna in 168 BC, reducing Macedonia to a Roman province. By this time, Rome dominated much of the Greek territory. Although winning the wars against Carthage and the Greeks, Rome was financially and emotionally drained due to the loss of thousands of soldiers in bloody battles. So then how could Rome be as strong as iron if it was in this weak state? Well, one thing was clear, that an unprofessional citizen army was no longer adequate for an empire the size of Rome. Gaius Marius, a statesman and general of the Roman Republic, initiated a group of military reforms which profoundly shaped the future of the Roman power. Up until this time, the Roman army was made up of the wealthier, land-owning citizens of Rome. It was a seasonal army, so it was formed only when the need arose. Each soldier had to provide their own equipment. This all became a dutiful exercise to defend their land and increase the borders of the Roman Empire. 
But the policies of Marius, which greatly improved the military, hinged upon the selfishness of the human heart. Here are some of the reforms. In 30 BC, the Imperial Roman Army was established. All Roman citizens who joined the army, including the poor, were paid well for their service. Thus it became a career. For the first time, the Roman state provided equipment to all, giving uniformity to their force. Each soldier was equipped with a short iron sword called a gladius, a spear called a pilum, iron chest armor and a long rectangular shield. The soldiers were offered inducements and bonuses through spoils gained in conquering new territory. Retirement benefits in the form of land grants were also provided. This was very enticing for the landless poor citizens of Rome. They were required to enlist for some 20 years of full military service, but many served as long as 30 to 40 years, thus giving Rome a standing professional army. Can you see how these policies played on human greed? For many of the soldiers, it was all about personal gain. Look at what the prophet John the Baptist had to say to these Roman soldiers. And the soldiers likewise demanded of him, saying, And what shall we do? And he said unto them, do violence to no man, neither accuse any falsely, and be content with your wages. The Roman generals had an iron grip on their soldiers, not only through the pleasure of personal gain, but through the use of extreme discipline. Here's an example. Decimation was a form of military discipline used by senior commanders in the Roman army to punish mutinous or cowardly soldiers. The word decimation is derived from Latin meaning removal of a tenth. A cohort selected for punishment by decimation was divided into groups of ten. Each group drew lots, sortition, and the soldier on whom the lot fell was executed by his nine comrades, often by stoning or clubbing. The remaining soldiers were often given rations of barley instead of wheat. When you compare these methods with dutiful service to a king or state like other kingdoms, you get a glimpse at the secret behind the strength of Rome. As a result of the military reforms made by Marius, the Roman generals, who were often political leaders, became too powerful within the Roman Republic. This caused the downfall of the Republic and the beginning of the emperors. The first emperor was Gaius Octavius, also known as Caesar Augustus. He became emperor in 27 BC. Augustus was the emperor when Jesus Christ was born. His successor, Tiberius Caesar, was emperor during Christ's crucifixion, resurrection and ascension. Augustus also played on the base nature of man through pleasure and fear in order to have an iron control not only over the military, but also over the populace of the Roman Empire. At this point in Roman history, unemployment was high. Large agricultural estates were supported by government grants. And these estates exploited slave labour from conquered lands. Small farms couldn't compete and gradually went out of business. This caused an influx of the unemployed into the cities. Augustus maintained control of these idle citizens through the pleasure and fear principle. The Emperor Augustus was well aware of this risk and was keen to keep the poorest plebeians happy enough and reasonably well fed so that they would not riot. He began the system of state bribery that the writer Juvenal described as bread and circuses. Free grain and controlled food prices meant that plebeians could not starve, while free entertainment such as chariot races and gladiators in amphitheatres and the Circus Maximus meant that they would not get bored and restless. Bribery it may have been, but it often worked. Bread and circuses gave the people an addiction to the Western lifestyle that Rome promoted. Rome built many entertainment centres in order to keep the masses amused. About 230 Roman amphitheatres have been found across the area of the Roman Empire. They were used for events such as gladiator combats, chariot races, venations or animal slayings and executions. Amphitheatres are distinguished from circuses, from hippodromes, which were usually rectangular and built mainly for racing events, and from stadia, 
built for athletics. Imperial amphitheatres comfortably accommodated 40,000 to 60,000 spectators, or up to 100,000 in the largest venues, and were only outdone by the hippodromes in seating capacity. Rome also employed capital punishment as a penalty for disobedience or rebellion. The Apostle Paul was charged before the Roman government for being a ringleader of a worldwide uprising. For we have found this man a pestilent fellow, and a mover of sedition among all the Jews throughout the world, and a ringleader of the sect of the Nazarenes. Consequently, Paul was brought before Nero in Rome and was beheaded for his Christian faith. Nero marks the beginning of the Christian persecution. These persecutions, beginning under Nero, about the time of the martyrdom of Paul, continued with greater or less fury for centuries. Christians were falsely accused of the most dreadful crimes and declared to be the cause of great calamities. As they became the objects of popular hatred and suspicion, informers stood ready, for the sake of gain, to betray the innocent. They were condemned as rebels against the empire, as foes of religion and pests to society. Great numbers were thrown to wild beasts or burned alive in the amphitheatre. Some were crucified, others were covered with the skins of wild animals and thrust into the arena to be torn by dogs. Their punishment was often made the chief entertainment at public fates. Vast multitudes assembled to enjoy the sight and greeted their dying agonies with laughter and applause. This policy of offering a combination of rewards and punishment to induce behaviour was a strength of Rome's iron power over the military and the masses. After Nero's death, another dynasty of Roman emperors arose, including Vespasian and his son Titus, who destroyed the city of Jerusalem in AD 70. Rome then continued for another 235 years until the reign of Constantine, which saw the empire divide, the capital city relocate, and a new state religion introduced. From Constantine onward, the Roman Empire was never the same again. Foreign elements were introduced, and the iron began to be mixed with miry clay. And whereas thou sawest the feet and toes part of potter's clay and part of iron, the kingdom shall be divided. But there shall be in it of the strength of the iron, or as much as thou sawest the iron mixed with miry clay. This prophecy of the division of the Roman Empire began as fulfillment during the third century AD. The Roman army was struggling to maintain the large borders of its empire. Due to internal and external pressures, Rome lost control of a significant portion of its eastern territory to the powerful trading city of Palmyra. By 271 AD, the Palmyrian Empire controlled a large portion of Asia Minor, spreading all the way down to Egypt. At the same time, the western frontier fell to a mutinous Roman army, which established their kingdom known as the Gaelic Empire, which held sway over Gaul, Spain and Britain. In 270 AD, during the height of this crisis, Emperor Aurelian emerged. After protecting the northern frontier against barbarian invaders, Aurelian restored Roman power in the east by conquering Palmyra in a series of battles in 272 AD. In the following year, Aurelian marched to Gaul to reclaim its western territory. In 274 AD, he defeated the Gallic Empire, ending the Roman crisis. However, Rome's instability continued. In 285 AD, Diocletian endeavoured to restore Rome's former strength and stability by dividing the power of government between four emperors, two senior emperors and two junior emperors. Diocletian, as senior emperor, ruled the east from Nicomedia, while Maximian, also a senior emperor, ruled the west from Milan. Galerius, a junior emperor, controlled Illyricum from Thessalonica. And Constantius, also a junior emperor, had power over Gaul and Britain from Trier. However, naming numerous emperors led only to more civil wars, making it easier for the barbaric tribes to invade. In 305 AD, Diocletian retired, and over the next two years, eight emperors began to fight for supremacy, bringing Rome near total collapse. However, Rome could not collapse at this point. 
if the prophecy of the iron and clay was to be fulfilled. Important changes needed to take place before Rome could be divided. Divine providence solved this crisis. After Diocletian retired, Maximian followed suit. The two former junior emperors, Galerius and Constantius, became senior emperors in the East and West, respectively. Severus was junior emperor to Constantius in the West, and Maximinus II was junior emperor to Galerius in the East. The following year, 306 AD, Constantius died in Britain, and his son, Constantine, was then proclaimed emperor by his father's army. However, this conflicted with Severus's new position as senior emperor in Rome. This news provoked Maxentius, son of Maximian, to proclaim himself as emperor in Rome also. Maxentius then called on his father to leave retirement to be co-emperor with him, and this he did. Maxentius and his father killed Severus to secure their position. Galerius, the eastern emperor, came to the west intending to dethrone Maximian. Galerius then appointed Licinius as emperor in the east, giving Rome six emperors once again. Constantine then captured Maximian, who afterward hanged himself. A number of months later, Galerius died, leaving the Roman Empire with four emperors. Maxentius and Maximinus II made an alliance, motivating Licinius to ally with Constantine. Soon after, Constantine destroyed Maxentius by defeating him and his army in 312 AD. Months later, Licinius defeated Maximinus and his army, which led Maximinus to commit suicide, leaving only two emperors in power. Constantine then went to war against Licinius, finally executing him and becoming sole ruler over the entire Roman Empire. The eastern regions were united with those of the west, and the whole body of the Roman Empire was graced by a single and supreme ruler. Constantine the Great was Rome's last emperor to rule the entire empire. This was necessary to fulfill biblical prophecy. Constantine made some very important changes that were like seeds to spring up in a Roman government of a different kind. During his 31 years of rulership, Constantine publicly professed Christianity, became the first Christian emperor and put a stop to Christian persecution through the Edict of Milan, in 313 AD. When you see that this has been granted to Christians by us, your worship will know that we have also conceded to other religions the right of open and free observance of their worship for the sake of the peace of our times, that each one may have the free opportunity to worship as he pleases. This regulation is made that we may not seem to detract from any dignity of any religion. Constantine also greatly favoured the church in Rome and flattered the bishops, donating land and wealth to the church. It was the aim of Constantine to make theology a branch of politics. It was the hope of every bishop in the empire to make politics a branch of theology. Constantine made theology a branch of politics by acting as supreme judge to solve doctrinal divisions within the church, even though he wasn't baptised. He dealt with the Donatist schism in North Africa by 320 AD. He also called and presided over the Council of Nicaea in 325 AD, attempting to solve the Godhead schism between Arianism and Trinitarianism. In 321 AD, Constantine issued his famous Sunday Edict. Constantine, Emperor Augustus, to Helpidius, on the venerable day of the sun, let the magistrates and people residing in cities rest, and let all workshops be closed. In the country, however, persons engaged in agriculture may freely and lawfully continue their pursuits, because it often happens that another day is not so suitable for grain sowing or vine planting, lest by neglecting the proper moment for such operations the bounty of heaven should be lost. 
Constantine also shifted the political capital from Rome to Byzantium, which he renamed Constantinople. This gave the Bishop of Rome more freedom to exercise civil authority within the city of Rome. So it was that Constantine opened the door of the state to the clergy. To the reign of Constantine the Great must be referred the commencement of those dark and dismal times which oppressed Europe for a thousand years. An ambitious man had attained to imperial power by personating the interests of a rapidly growing party. The unavoidable consequences were a union between the church and the state, a diverting of the dangerous classes from civil to ecclesiastical paths, and the decay and materialization of religion. This joining of church and state was an irresistible temptation to the bishops of Rome. The bishops believed that pagan Rome was the oppressor of the Christians as Egypt was the oppressor of the Israelites, and that Constantine was to the Christians as Moses was to the children of Israel. The Roman historian and bishop Eusebius, who lived in the days of Constantine, writes this. For as once in the days of Moses and the Hebrew nation, who were worshippers of God, he cast Pharaoh's chariots and his host into the waves and drowned his chosen chariot captains in the Red Sea. So at this time did Maxentius and the soldiers and guards with him sink to the bottom as a stone, when in his flight before the divinely aided forces of Constantine he essayed to cross the river which lay in his way. They also believed that the church was to be a theocracy, a nation to overall nations, as Israel was in the days of King David. This idea appears clear and full in Eusebius' book, The Life of Constantine. Furthermore, the bishops believed that this new theocracy would be governed by the church officers. Accordingly, the bishops considered themselves as invested with a rank and character similar to those of the high priest among the Jews while the presbyters represented the priests and the deacons the Levites. This is how the Bishop of Rome became known as the High Priest, or in Latin, Pontificus Maximus. With the combination of Constantine joining church and state with the erroneous beliefs of the bishops, the seed was firmly sown that would spring up as papal Rome. With Constantine's life work complete, he died in 337 AD the old Roman Empire could now descend into division. The kingdom shall be divided. Now we will consider the history that fulfills this prophecy. The northern borders of the Roman Empire were the Rhine and Danube rivers. Julius Caesar named the regions east of the Rhine Germania. Within these regions lay a multitude of ethnic tribes. All these tribes have become known as the Germanic tribes. The Romans called them barbarians. Among these were the Angles, the Jutes, the Saxons, the Thuringians, the Vandals, the Suvi, the Burgundians, the Franks, the Alemanni, the Visigoths, the Ostrogoths, the Gepids, the Huruli, the Lombards, and the list goes on. For decades, various barbaric tribes were making continual incursions into Roman territory. The Roman army maintained the borders until the Huns appeared in Europe. The Huns were a savage nomadic people who originated from China. As the Huns moved toward the Germanic tribes, this ignited the great migration of the Germanic peoples into the weak Roman Empire. This was only about 25 years after Rome was divided between Constantine's three sons. In 351 AD, the Franks and Alemanni crossed the Rhine never to return. The Alemanni settled in Agri Decimates, from the river Main to Lake Constance. They spread to the regions of Alsace-Lorraine and extended to Seine by 455 AD. The Franks settled in Gaul and extended to Somme and Seine by 455 AD. These two tribes are the roots of modern-day France and Germany. The territory of these two great confederacies, the Franks and the Alemanni, is constantly spoken of by contemporary writers as Francia and Alemania. We feel that we are standing on the verge of modern history when we recognise in these two names the France and the Alemania of the French newspaper of today. 
Though other elements have been abundantly blended with each confederacy, it is not altogether forbidden us to recognize in these two barbarous neighbors of the Roman Empire in the 4th century the ancestors of the two mighty nations which in our own day met in thunder on the plains of Gravelote. As the Huns pushed into Europe in 370 AD, fear fell on all the barbaric tribes. As warriors, the Huns inspired almost unparalleled fear throughout Europe. They were amazingly accurate mounted archers and their complete command of horsemanship. Their ferocious charges and unpredictable retreats and the speed of their strategical movements brought them overwhelming victories. As the Huns advanced into Germania, many tribes were forced aside like the bow wave of a ship. The Alani were dispersed and joined other Germanic tribes. The Huns drove the Ostrogoths, or the Eastern Goths, upon the Visigoths, or Western Goths, who were hemmed in by the Danube, but compelled to cross it into Roman territory in 376 AD. As a band of refugees, the Visigoths looked to the Eastern Roman Emperor for safety. After many years of cruel treatment at the hand of the Eastern Empire, the Visigoth King Alaric arose in 395 AD. Alaric led his people through Pannonia and into Milan by 408. Next, he advanced down the peninsula and sacked Rome in 410 AD. The Visigoths then moved into southern Gaul and finally settled in Spain by 466 AD. Their depredations culminated in the sack of Rome in 410. In the same year, Alaric died and was succeeded by Atolphus, who led the Visigoths to settle first in southern Gaul, then in Spain. Not only the Goths, but other Germanic tribes could not withstand the rapid progress of the Huns. The Burgundians, Vandals, Suvi and the Alani temporarily united. And on December 31, 406 AD, this confederacy crossed over the frozen Rhine and entered into Roman territory. The victorious confederates pursued their march, and on the last day of the year, 406, in a season when the waters of the Rhine were most probably frozen, they entered, without opposition, the defenceless provinces of Gaul. This memorable passage of the Suevi, the Vandals, the Alani, the Burgundians, who never afterwards retreated, may be considered as the fall of the Roman Empire in the countries beyond the Alps and the barriers which had so long separated the savage and the civilized nations of the earth were from that fatal moment leveled with the ground. The Burgundians settled in Burgundy in 420 AD and went on to spread over West Switzerland and the Valley of the Rhine between 443 and 476 AD. The Suvi, Vandals and Alani moved down into Spain by 409 AD. In 418, the Alani king Atassus was killed by the incoming Visigoths. The Alani then offered their crown to the Vandal king Gunderic. As a result, the separate ethnic identity of the Alani was lost to the Vandals. As the Visigoths moved into Spain, they pushed the Suvi into Galicia, where they settled and established a kingdom which incorporated other small Germanic tribes like the Quadi, Buri and the Marcomanni, who had also left Germania. The Subic Kingdom spread throughout what is now Portugal by 466 AD. The Vandals, on the other hand, had an open door into North Africa. So it was in May 429 AD, the Vandals crossed the Strait of Gibraltar and began their settlement. By 439, the Vandals spread their kingdom to the stronghold of Carthage. The Vandals, as we know, ruled Africa from Carthage. The Burgundians were settled in the Valley of the Rhine, and their chief capital was Lyon. The Suevi held the greater part of southern and western Spain, and their capital was Astorgia. While Spain was being overtaken, Rome pulled back its troops from Britain by 409 AD in order to protect territory closer to Rome. This action made the Roman British people vulnerable. Some Celtic tribes immediately took advantage of this situation. The Picts invaded from the north and the Scots from the west. However, the Celtic people were about to meet their match. A number of Germanic tribes had their sights set on Britain. The Saxons were invited by the Britons to help fend off the Picts and the Scots. So it was that the Saxons arrived on British soil. They came by invitation of Vortigern, king of the Britons. 
the king gave them land in the southeast of the country, on condition that they should fight against the Picts, and they did fight, and had the victory wheresoever they came. And then they sent for the Angles, and told them of the worthlessness of the people, and the excellences of the land. This is the Saxon narrative. The Saxons pushed the Picts back past the old Roman frontier, preventing the Celts from gaining control of Britain. But the Saxons turned against the Britons whom they had come to help. The Angles and Jutes from Denmark and the Frisians from France also joined the Saxons in the invasion of Britain. The native Britons were then pushed into the southwestern corner, known today as Wales. The Angles and Saxons then dominated the British island. So it is from 449 AD that the history of Angleland or England begins. Four years after the Saxons placed their feet on British soil, the kingdom of Attila the Hun came to a sudden stop in 453 AD. As you have seen, many of the Germanic tribes escaped the Huns by migrating into Roman territory, but not all. The Hunnic kingdom dominated and incorporated many tribes, like the Gepids, the Thuringians, the Lombards, the Ostrogoths, the Huruli, and the Rugian. When Attila the Hun died on his wedding night, his large empire practically vanished, giving independence to the tribes once under his control. In 453 AD, the Ostrogothic kingdom established themselves within the borders of the Roman Empire in the lands of Pannonia. When the Hunnish Empire broke in pieces on the death of Attila, AD 453, the East Goths recovered their full independence. They now entered into relations with the empire and settled on lands in Pannonia. Likewise, the Lombards regained their freedom after the death of Attila the Hun. Attila's sudden death either by hemorrhage or the vengeance of his Burgundian bride, checked the progress of the Hunnish Empire. The Ostrogoths, the Jeopardy, and the Langobards obtained their independence after a severe struggle, whilst the remains of the nomadic Huns were lost in the rich pastoral steppes of southern Russia. The Lombards first settled within the Roman territory of Noricum in 453 AD. The Thuringians filled some of the void left in Germania by the Great Migration, but did not settle within Roman territory. The Gepids were overthrown by the Ostrogoths, Lombards, and an Asian tribe called the Avars. The Rugians also settled outside of Roman territory. Lastly, in 475 AD, the Heruli moved into Italy under their king Odysker. Odysker overthrew the last Roman emperor, Romulus, in 476 AD becoming the first barbarian king over Italy. Odoacer was the first barbarian who reigned in Italy over a people who had once asserted their just superiority above the rest of mankind. Rome was finally divided in 476 AD. Ten kingdoms, ten distinct and independent nations, no more, no less, had fixed themselves within the boundaries of the old Roman Empire. And the prophecy that was spoken and written more than a thousand years before was literally fulfilled. Although Rome lost its territory to the various nations of Europe, it regained its territory in the hearts and minds of mankind. Divine prophecy foretold Rome would remain until the end of earthly kingdoms. Rome evolved from the old pagan empire into a religious power that is still felt today. As Rome was being pulled apart by the Germanic invasions, the Church of Rome played an important role to secure its own existence. In 460 AD, Pope Leo the Great said this, while Romulus and Remus were the twin founders of ancient Rome, it was through the missionary efforts of the apostles Peter and Paul that Rome, the mother of error, was transformed into the daughter of truth. Rome did not really pave the way for the Christian faith. Rather, the Christian faith paved the way for Rome to be transformed into the Christian city that it was meant to be. Peter and Paul, not Romulus and Remus, were the men who raised Rome to this glory, that Rome might be made head of the world through the sacred throne 
of blessed Peter. Pope Leo taught that the existence of Rome was a result of the church. He not only taught it, but he demonstrated it by creating peace with the Huns. It became clear that neither the emperor nor the magister militum had any chance of halting the Huns' advance. So Leo the Great, Bishop of Rome and first Pope of the Christian Church, took matters into his own hands. He travelled north to intercede with the king of the Huns on his own. Attila agreed to see him, and the two men met at the Po River. Afterwards Leo never wrote or spoke of what had passed between them, but when the audience had ended, Attila had agreed for peace. Leo returned to Rome, haloed with victory. For the first time in history, a bishop had taken the emperor's job. As spiritual leader, he could also claim the right to guarantee the church's physical survival. So after the division of the Roman Empire, the Church of Rome had secured its place as a power that would last to the end of time. And as the toes of the feet were part of iron and part of clay, so the kingdom shall be partly strong and partly broken. And whereas thou sawest iron mixed with miry clay, they shall mingle themselves with the seed of men. But they shall not cleave one to another, even as iron is not mixed with clay. Since the fall of the Roman Empire, many attempts to unite the nations into one distinct nation have been made. However, the prophecy simply states, but they shall not cleave one to another, even as iron is not mixed with clay. In 711 AD began an Islamic invasion of the old Roman Empire's territory. The Muslim power gained control of North Africa, Spain, Portugal and part of France, but failed to subdue the entire region. In 768, Charlemagne, King of France, expanded his territory and became the protector of Papal Rome. He made incursions into Muslim Spain and removed the Lombards from power in Italy. Papal Rome established the Holy Roman Empire in an attempt to recreate the old empire of Rome. In so doing, the Pope crowned Charlemagne the first emperor of the Holy Roman Empire in December 25, 800 AD. The Holy Roman Empire wasn't actually Roman or holy, nor was it a true empire, and failed completely at uniting Europe under one government. The territories making up the empire lay predominantly in Central Europe. At its peak in 1050, under Emperor Henry III, it included the Kingdom of Germany, the Kingdom of Bohemia, the Kingdom of Italy, and the Kingdom of Burgundy. The last Holy Roman Emperor was Francis II, who abdicated and dissolved the empire in 1806 during the Napoleonic Wars. In 1554, Spain emerged as a dominant power under King Philip II. Through marriage, wars and diplomacy, King Philip gained power over a large portion of Europe. While King of Spain, he became King of Portugal. Through marriage to Queen Mary, he became King of England, Ireland and claimed to be King of France. He was heir of the Duchy of Burgundy and was Lord of 17 provinces of the Netherlands, plus many other titles. When his wife, Queen Mary, died, he lost his kingship over England. After being rejected by Queen Elizabeth I for marriage, he attempted to regain his power by sending the invincible Spanish Armada against England. The Spanish Armada was pushed north by the English fleet and was shipwrecked off the west coast of Ireland by a violent storm, destroying Spain's chance of uniting the various nations under one flag. Napoleon was the next to attempt the uniting of Europe. In 1814, his borders reached their extent. However, as with the Spanish Armada, his plans were thwarted by bad weather. In 1814, his army was defeated at the Battle of Waterloo. Not long after Napoleon, Queen Victoria of England came to power and eventually became known as the Grandmother of Europe. She and Prince Albert had nine children, and most were married off to other European royal families. Victoria had 42 grandchildren, and a number of them held the crown of European nations. King George V of the UK, Wilhelm II, German Emperor and King of Prussia, Sophia, 
Queen of Greece, Maud, Queen of Norway, Alexandra, Empress of Russia, Marie, Queen of Romania. It is said all European nations were related by 1914, and although they shall mingle themselves with the seed of men, it was no help when the First World War started. They simply shall not cleave one to another. In more recent times, Adolf Hitler almost spread the German nation across all of Europe. From 1939, Hitler overran nation after nation, his empire reaching its height in 1941-42. to 42. Again, God's providence stepped in and a freezing winter crippled his army and caused the death of over a million troops, making it one of the most catastrophic military failures in history. His army never recovered and was soon crushed by English and American forces. Even on a diplomatic level, true unification has proven impossible. In 1993, the European Union began, but has not consolidated the nations into one cohesive empire. It's important to note that the kingdoms of Europe have extended their influence over the entire world. England took a quarter of the world at its peak. Spain was not far behind, and through the United States, much of the world is heavily influenced by European culture. Germany, France, Portugal and the Netherlands also made many colonies over the world. It is clear that the division of the Roman Empire has influenced the entire world as we know it. Although there is talk about a one world government, this will never fully come to fruition. It has failed in the past, it will fail in the future, because the prophecy is clear, but they shall not cleave one to another, even as iron is not mixed with clay. The climax of the prophecy is here brought to view. When the history of nations is considered, it is very clear that kingdoms come and kingdoms go. But here is presented a kingdom that will not be destroyed. And in the days of these kings shall the God of heaven set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed. And the kingdom shall not be left to other people, but it shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms, and it shall stand forever. The reason for this is found in the next verse. For as much as thou sawest that the stone was cut out of the mountain without hands, and that it break in pieces the iron, the brass, the clay, the silver, and the gold, the great God hath made known to the king what shall come to pass hereafter. That it was cut out without hands is the reason given that it will never be destroyed. What is the stone, and what is meant that it was cut out without hands? Jesus Christ, when speaking to the Jews, tells us what this crushing stone is. And he beheld them and said, What is this then that is written? The stone which the builders rejected, the same is become the head of the corner. Whosoever shall fall upon that stone shall be broken, but on whomsoever it shall fall, it will grind him to powder. Speaking to the Jews again, Jesus tells us what it means to be cut out without hands. I will destroy this temple that is made with hands, and within three days I will build another made without hands. In this statement Jesus made, he was speaking about the temple of his body. Jesus answered and said unto them, Destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. Then said the Jews, Forty and six years was this temple in building, and wilt thou rear it up in three days? But he spoke of the temple of his body. The meaning is clear. With hands means the thing is accomplished through a human agency. Without hands means through a supernatural agency. This is further proven in the book of Hebrews. But Christ being come and high priest of good things to come by a greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is to say, not of this building. Moses built the Hebrew sanctuary with all its offerings and ceremonies. This was done through the human agency. But when Christ went to heaven after his resurrection, he entered into the heavenly sanctuary. And that is referred to as not being made with hands. In other words, there was no human input into the building of it. The mountain that was the origin of the stone is recorded in Hebrews 12 verse 22. But ye are come unto Mount Zion, 
and unto the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and to an innumerable company of angels. Therefore this stone that is cut out without hands refers to the resurrected, glorified Christ, who will leave the heavenly city, known as Mount Zion, return to earth in a physical, literal, and visible manner as king and ruler of this world. This stone is not any particular church or religious organization, because these are all administered by human beings. It is important to note that this final and everlasting dominion is set up without human power or help. No human agency is responsible for the stone being cut out of the mountain, nor responsible for it being hurled with great force against the image. The setting up of this everlasting kingdom and the destruction of the earthly dominions are accomplished by Jesus Christ himself. The timing of the setting up of this final kingdom is clearly indicated Although no exact time is given, a way mark is clearly laid out before us. And in the days of these kings shall the God of heaven set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed. The plurality of kings here mentioned refers to the division made after the fall of the Roman Empire in 476 AD. We are currently still living in this European division and therefore are living in the days of these kings or kingdoms. So the kingdom that is yet to be realized is to be done so during the existence of the various nations of Europe and before any one world government comes to fruition. Now some may say that the kingdom was realized during the first advent of Jesus Christ. Christ plainly taught that his kingdom was still future when he had the last supper with his disciples. And he took the cup and gave thanks and said, Take this and divide it among yourselves. For I say unto you, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God shall come. Again, Christ did not set up this kingdom before his ascension. When they therefore were come together, they asked of him, saying, Lord, wilt thou at this time restore again the kingdom to Israel? And he said unto them, It is not for you to know the times or the seasons which the Father hath put in his own power. Also, Christ did not teach us something to pray for that was already fulfilled when he said, pray, thy kingdom come, thy will be done. The Bible teaches us that this kingdom is a matter of promise to the believer in Christ. Hearken, my beloved brethren, hath not God chosen the poor of this world, rich in faith, and heirs of the kingdom which he hath promised to them that love him? And it was told us in the scriptures that it would be set up when Christ shall judge the living and the dead. I charge thee therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the quick and the dead at his appearing and his kingdom. Some may ask, what kingdom was realized when Christ first came to earth? There are two types of kingdoms brought to light in the Bible. The kingdom of grace and the kingdom of glory. One is current and the other is future. This is simply shown by the text in Hebrews where it says to come boldly before the throne of grace. This is present tense. The other is mentioned in Matthew 25, 31, when the Son of Man shall come in his glory and all the holy angels with him and he shall sit upon the throne of his glory. And this is future. A throne implies a kingdom and so the kingdom of grace was realized during Jesus' first advent and the kingdom of glory will be realized at his second advent. The prophecy tells us that during the existence of the various nations of Europe, that Jesus Christ himself will set up a kingdom. It will not be left in the hands of a church or an organization or a board of directors or any other representative. Christ himself personally will administer this kingdom. It also tells us that when he comes, the nations of this world will be destroyed. This is the time when all wickedness and evil will cease to rule our world. Looking at the history of the world as we have done, there has only been war, bloodshed and wickedness and mankind does not have the capacity to develop a righteous kingdom in this world at the time of the destruction of the nations babylon persia greece and rome will lose all the legacy they have left behind and it is then that the gold and silver brass and iron will cease to exist in all things while babylon persia greece and rome do not have dominion. What they have done while they had dominion 
is still present in our world today. Babylon, the source of cultic religion and spiritualism, is alive and well today. Persia, that pioneered the principles of rulership through global economy and worldwide trade, is also very prominent today. Greece introduced philosophy and mind culture, coupled with sports and Olympic games, that has never been lost in our world. Rome, with the principles of an iron government, clothed in the garb of democracy and republicanism, is also alive and well today. However, when Jesus Christ comes, all this, the gold and the silver, the brass and the iron, will be destroyed and forgotten in the kingdom to come. Then was the iron, the clay, the brass, the silver and the gold broken to pieces together and became like the chaff of the summer threshing floors. And the wind carried them away, that no place was found for them. After the nations have been blown away and the earth has been cleaned from their existence, then Mount Zion will fill the whole earth. And the stone that smote the image became a great mountain and filled the whole earth. God has made a guarantee that that which is yet to take place is sure to happen. And the prophecy is true and faithful. Daniel gives this guarantee to the king of Babylon. The great God hath made known to the king what shall come to pass hereafter. And the dream is certain and the interpretation thereof sure. The prophecy has been accurate for well over 2,000 years. And it would be very unwise to dismiss the last part of the prophecy as untrue. In the book of Psalms, it gives us good instruction as to the last part of Daniel chapter 2. It is better to trust in the Lord than to put confidence in men. It is better to trust in the Lord than to put confidence in princes. The instruction was to trust the Lord. The center verse of the King James Bible is Psalms 118 verse 8. It is better to trust in the Lord than to put confidence in man. God loves you and wants you to have an expected end. Unlike all the nations before us, we need to take heed to the warnings so that we can be with Christ in his glorious kingdom.